Well, Joanna, it is so great to have you joining me on the Nothing Is Wasted podcast. Thanks for being here. Oh, I'm so honored. Thank you for having me, Davey. And thanks for waking up early to join us. Oh, my goodness. Tell us where you are and what time you're waking up to hang out with us. (laughs) Well, I'm in Montana and honestly, isn't so bad. It's only seven o'clock here. But I was up at 6.05 for another interview a little bit earlier than that, of course, to get ready for the interview. But yeah, but it's so fun. I love your ministry. I love what you guys are doing. And it's just an honor to be on the show. Uh, well, thank you. Well, I love your work. Um, you, you're releasing this book, Embracing Trust. And, you know, one of the one of the works I'm familiar with, I know a lot of our audience is going to be familiar with, is having a, a merry heart in a Martha world, um, which is a book that you've previously released. That's a bestseller. And uh, I love that concept. I love everything that you wrote about in it. Um, and so, you know, we, we might touch on that in this conversation, but I'm really intrigued by this book that you're releasing now, Embracing Trust. And it's and because it's the art of letting go and holding on to a forever faithful God. And I know that every person who's listening to this as they're going through the dark night of the soul, the valley of the shadow of death, yeah. they're learning this. Mm. They're learning what it looks like to let go. Right. Well, I think we have to. We don't want to. But we have to if we're going Mm. to experience the peace of God. And, you know, as when I first started thinking and wanting to write this book, it was all about letting go and trusting God, which it really is the heart of the message. But after we've done that, then I think after we've let go and surrender, then we can really hold on to God, not not to an outcome. You know, there are things that we're going to have to release We're going to have to let Mm. go of in order to move into our future. But when we do, I've just found out of surrender, full surrender comes full trust, not perfect trust, but the ability to trust him more than we ever have before. Mm. Wow. You know, it's, it's funny. You you and I are both very familiar with church culture. And so sometimes you can sit in church services or you can listen to Christian radio, or you can, you know, hear people talk about this concept and and you kind of wonder do, have they ever gone through something difficult? They, do they even know what they're, cause they're just, they seem to be just kind of saying this almost haphazardly like, Oh, the Bible says we should trust and let, let the Lord surrender, you know? And yet this comes from uh, some very deep wrestling that you've done because of your own story, your own life. And yeah. so I'd love for you to share a little bit about that. And then let's, then maybe we can untangle some of the concepts that you talk about in the book because of what you have learned over the past several years um, in your story. So tell us a little bit about you and then let's kind of dive into your story. Yeah, well, you know what? I am truly blessed. I was raised in a grace-filled home in a grace-filled church. And, um, you know, sometimes I, I think that I feel a little bit like, um, Lord, why did you choose me to write about trust? Mm. Because I don't feel like I've had some of the horrible, terrible things um, happen to me that I know some of your listeners have. But I've found that pain is relative. And if it's my pain, it's relatively painful. (laughs) And so letting God into those spaces, I think, and actually believing that he can redeem all of the pain, all of the sorrow, all of the, because we all have it. I mean, you cannot get through life without being scathed. We live in a fallen world filled with fallen people. Um, We do things to each other that is so devastating and just the trauma of life itself, because this isn't heaven. And I think sometimes we forget that, that, um, and yet God in his mercy comes and he takes those things and he redeems them and he uses Mm. them for his glory. But so for my own story, um, you know, looking back, and so this book is really personal, and I kind of chart some of those pivotal moments where I had to let go and trust God. I realized, yeah. oh, I guess I did have some trauma. I guess I yeah. did have some tragedy. You know, it may yeah. not measure up to some other people's, but it definitely was hard to navigate. And so um, even though, you know, I love Jesus with all my heart, and I kind of came to Christianity thinking that, you know, if I do A and I do B, do B then God will do C, that life yeah. will be this uninterrupted upward climb to success and significance and doing great right. things for Jesus. And instead, the Lord has allowed, you know, betrayal. He's mm. a- allowed um, broken dreams. He's allowed... Uh, He's kept me small when everything within my flesh wanted to be big and yeah. be significant. In his mercy, 
He has not given me the things I craved because I mm. think had he done that, I would have missed, I would have missed the sweetest gift of all, which is wow. Jesus himself. And so, um, yeah, we, we entered, God called me to ministry at 16, gave me a vision of the man I would marry, my one and only vision. Unfortunately, he didn't give the same vision to him. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he broke up with me with me for another girl without kind of telling me that was a little oh. awkward um okay. but you know coming to that place of letting go of what i thought my life would be and just saying okay god my life is yours here's the quill of my will you write mm. my story um you know god was merciful to bring my husband to his senses and he <laughs> He came back around, and so <laughs> <He came. laughs> uh, we entered ministry, full-time ministry. I was 19, he was 23, mm. and I just thought we were going to do big things for Jesus, you know, served at a little church, and I thought we'd have, you know, hundreds of kids in our youth group, set up 30, 35 chairs, and it wasn't unusual to have 30, 32 empty ones, you know, yep, and uh um, yep. Again, yeah. God confounding my need of success because it, it, without yeah. realizing it, it really was an idol in my soul. And so anyway, there's mm. been a lot of, a lot of that where I had to realize that, uh, you know, God's dreams can become man's schemes and the call mm. can be fancy food for the flesh. And in his mercy, God did not reward my drivenness, my desire for success because I, I trembled to think where I would have been had mm. I gotten my own way. And so um, just trusting him in that, trusting yeah. that um, I hadn't messed it up. I hadn't missed it. It was God who was at work in all of it, even what looked like failure, even when the worst thing that I feared came true. Mm. I found his love. I found wow. that... Um, this end of what I think the end of the story is, it's sometimes just the beginning of a new chapter. If yeah, we'll give yeah. that pain and that disappointment to the Lord. Wow. That's so good. You know, uh, it, it's very tempting to like categorize pain and to kind of, you know, place, place it into certain buckets in terms of this is the type of pain that someone's dealing with. So, you know, and, and, and to some respect we can, right. There's certain types of tragedies that, that befall somebody, you know, that, that, it was no, none of their doing. Right. And then there's certain right. types of pain that they've kind of, uh, they've induced themselves, right. Self-inflicted type pain. And then there's, there's a lot of nuance in between, you know, but you just alluded to something that I felt that I felt the pain of that sometimes we don't acknowledge that it is pain. Mm -hmm. And because there's a huge wrestling and that's this dream or desire to have something, right. You can fill in the blank or to have someone or to, you know, what, what really, prompted me was when you talked about planting this church and setting up 35 chairs and having 33 empty and just feeling this constant, almost like success, significance, or whatever you would deem your measure of success in that kind of endeavor. It's almost eluding you. It's like, you can't quite chase it down. It, and it almost feels like God's resisting that, right? Yeah. That he's continuing to put you into places of obscurity and put you places in trust and that it can be very difficult when it comes to the culture that we live in, where mm. we see everybody else's success now plastered all over their Instagram profiles and their Facebook profiles. And yet yeah. I would venture to say that most of us feel the same twinge of disappointment that you just described feeling that same twins of twinge of the thing that I want the most seems to be eluding me. Can you speak to that a little bit? Cause maybe it's not, you know, a growing fast growing church or, but maybe right. it's a, maybe it's, you know, a, a couple that they've been trying to have a child for a long yes. time, or maybe it's the, you know, uh, the, the particular uh, position at a job that they've, somebody has been wanting for so long. And, and those can easily be dismissed as like, ah, oh, that's not that big of a deal. And yet we can see our soul begin to kind of fester and even erode as we, as we are finding ourselves in disappointment, Right. Hope deferred yeah. makes the heart grow sick. So can you just kind of speak to that and the importance of where God shows up in those spaces? Yeah. Well, you know, um, I, I think it was Beth Moore with where I first heard it. She said that legitimate needs can turn into abnormal desires. Mm. 
And, and mm. if we're not careful, that that thing that we long for can become an idol in our hearts. You know, we really wow. believe that unless I have that, I can't be happy. I can't feel successful. And so uh, without knowing it, we're, we're chasing something that we've put in the place of God. And mm. that's the danger. Now, you know, as I've really been thinking about that, you know, if we if we stop with the first half of the book, letting go and surrender, you know, yeah. and we kind of become Christian Buddhists, you know, the absence of all desire. That's yeah. not that's not what God wants either. You know, as you look at the word of God, he says, "He de delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. I mean, yeah. we have this good, good father who wants to give good and perfect gifts. But if mm. in giving us mm. that gift, he actually does damage to our soul, then... Mm then that would not be a good, perfect father, it's right? Yeah, it's right. not a gift. It, it actually goes to our undoing. You know, you read, you read Israel's, you know, this push pull with God and they're demanding mm. these things and saying, we've got to have this, give us this. And there's this one verse and I can't remember where it's found, but oh my goodness, it just, it sends shivers down my soul where it says he gave them what they wanted, but sent mm. leanness to their souls. Right? Wow. Wow. If that thing that I think I must have in order for happiness actually results in leanness in my soul, a shriveled soul, a, a, a diminished relationship with my maker, then is it really what I want? And, mm. um, and I know that's so hard to hear because especially when we're, there's that hope deferred, you know, there's mm. some people listening today that they had a promise from God. I mean, a, a definite word from the Lord. And what is this all about? Yeah. Why, why has everything crumbled in my hands? How, you know, and so what we're left with is one of two conclusions. Something's wrong with me or something's mm. wrong with God. Wow. And those are dangerous places to be. And that's right. why I think we've got to bring those desires to the Lord. And we just got to yeah. say, Lord, I give you this longing. I give you mm. this desire, Lord, I, I trust that you know what is best. And in your time and in your way, if this is truly for my good and for your glory, you will bring it to pass. But I cannot cling to this idol anymore wow. because it's destroying my soul. Wow. Man, that is so good. So good. Um, You know, Joanna, we... Uh, I was telling you a little bit off air. We have a, we have a course that, you know, called pain to purpose and, and one of the, what we call waypoints, there's like 11 videos, 10 waypoints. And, and one of the waypoints, we talk about the classroom of pain mm -hmm. and, um, and it's kind of like the 10 it's suggestions. It's almost like, Hey, these are 10 things God might be teaching you in your pain. Mm -hmm. And in one of those, we teach that he might be revealing to you idols yeah. or exposing this. Can you kind of talk through a little bit of, you know, as, as you think through your story, you think through your life and some of these places of disappointment, some of these places of betrayal, can you kind of point out to us instances where you think that those pain points were necessary Yeah. for oh, you yeah. to see these idols, maybe get, maybe anecdotally even like maybe if there's sure. a story that you can think of where it's like, yeah, you know, this is where I finally realized this is, this was necessary that I walked through this. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You know, um, I think probably I can kind of trace it back to when I finished having a merry heart in a Martha world, I really wanted mm. to write this book on trust. I thought that was the next one. And so I took what I thought was going to be a six month sabbatical. And instead it turned into a six year dark night of the soul. Oh, wow. <laughs> and um, I shouldn't say six years, a dark night, but definitely 18 months of the dark wow. night of the soul where God used the removal of approval and mm. uh, allowed some relationships in our church to implode. Uh, my closest friends, the women that were kind of, they had come beside me during having a merry heart and taken a lot wow. of the load of ministry. These were the most godly women in the church. And yet the enemy got in there and a careless remark, just me spouting off my opinion, was the tinder that started mm. a forest fire and literally imploded what had been a thriving ministry. And it was interesting. We'd get together. We would try, you know, 
we would be reconciled. We'd cry. We'd, we'd pray together. We'd say, how did we let this happen? And two hours later, Davy, things would be twisted and it would be even worse. There was a demonic activity going wow. on that wasn't wow. just aimed at me. It was to take out those beautiful women yeah. as well. And yeah. what, um, so this went on, you know, this broken relationship for like 10 months and it, I couldn't fix it. I couldn't make mm. it better. And I remember I would lay in bed at night and these tapes would go through my mind, you know, the attorney for the defense. And I had the yeah. defense. I knew if I could just get them to understand this. And I had yeah. character witnesses. I mean, I was already. And then there was the uh, the prosecuting attorney that also mm. had all of the information on them and how they were wrong. And yeah. yet the Lord, he, he just kept me in this vice and revealing this flesh that I don't know that I really knew. The flesh where Paul writes in Romans, in me, that is in my flesh, no good thing dwells. I didn't mm. realize that there was a 683 pound sumo wrestler chick inside of me that was a church girl that as long as you did things her way, she was fine. But boy, if you crossed her, whoo. Wow. And the Lord began to say, Joanna, you think it's about them. You think, and all you can see is the injustice of what they've done to you. But I want to show you some of the fault lines that have run down your soul since a little girl, this desperate need for everybody to tell you who you are, to let wow. you know that you're okay, that you have significance. And he literally stripped it all. I remember telling my husband, I said, I feel like I've just been stripped down to the chassis and I'm up on blocks and I'm shivering and naked and cold. And there's all these perfectly good pieces all around me that mm. I just want to put myself back together. But I said, you know what? I want to be new more than I want to be comfortable. And so mm. the Lord just let that stretch on as he did this deep soul work in me. And I can honestly say, David, uh, Davey, that I would do it a thousand times again wow. for what he did in me. And yet I, I have to confess, I thought I was going to die. I, I mean, yeah. my daughter yeah. was, was probably 10, 11 or 12 during that time. And, you know, you think you're handling it well, but yeah. she just a couple of years ago, she goes, was that the time where you were in your bedroom crying all the time? <laughs> like <laughs> that would be the time. Yep, that, would, that was that season. <laughs> yep. That was it. Yeah. And then the Lord wow. took me out of the wow. dark night of the soul into an unexpected pregnancy at 40 and hmm. kind of back it down into the dark night of the soul. Well, you're, because, wait, you're talking about a, a real pregnancy, not, not, we're not talking yes. spiritual pregnancy over here. Oh, no, wow. no. Wow. I, it was so funny because I had just said, I had just said, you know, if I knew Jessica and John Michael would have turned out so wonderful, I would have had more kids. And then six wow. months later, I'm, I'm pregnant and we, I have a 17 year old. I told my friend, I said, I never thought I would be shopping for cribs and colleges at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, yeah, but it could be worse. You could be shopping for diapers and depends, you know? So there wow, is that. That's true. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that six, that six year dark night of the soul actually was pretty accurate. It was just it uh, was. You know, compounded. Yeah. yeah <laughs> it was compounded it was. with having a new baby and yeah. postpartum and all of that. Wow. But out Man. of that came the second book, Having a Merry Spirit, hmm. allowing God to change us from the inside out. And, you know, for me, those transformational points can be, tr mm. can be linked to trusting him and surrender most definitely, That's right, yeah. but they all had a pain. There was a pain point. There was mm. where my flesh was being confounded because God didn't wanted to do a deep work in my soul for the purpose of setting me free. That's right. Of That's purifying right. those desires, of purifying my call to ministry, stripping away the flesh. Wow. It, it comes through pain. And, uh, you know, the enemy thinks we're going to take her out. We're going to take that person mm -hmm. out. But God goes, no, I'm going to turn this for their deliverance and That's the good. deliverance of many. That's good. I had a friend tell me the other day, he said, it's just like God to weaponize what the enemy does in your life mm -hmm. against the enemy. And I love that phraseology, weaponize. <laughs> I had never. It. It's so like, I don't know, it's so forceful. And so like, I mean, it was very powerful of a statement to say he's turning this around as a weapon against the enemy Amen. to advance his kingdom. And that's for, that's true of all of our pain and everything that we go through as long as, and I, and I want to say this, as long as we're leaning into yeah. 
that classroom of pain. Because I, I want to acknowledge this, Joanna, that, that takes a lot of uh, transparency, humility, and awareness yeah. to even, to one, be able to know that w- what you just articulated right there, to be able to know, you know, this some of these betrayals that I was experiencing, they weren't just binary. It wasn't just, because yeah. we can often approach it like that. It's like, a, well, they're 100% wrong. <laughs> I am completely in the right. I am such a victim in this situation. Mm-hmm. And, and, and there are situations that definitely proportionally lean more toward that. So I don't want to dismiss those situations. However, a lot of times relational tensions, relational strife, whether it be in the church, whether it be in small groups, whether it be just in workplaces, it's a lot more um, disproportionate than just, you know, 100% zero. And, and yet we kind of see, we tend to see it that way. Right. But for you to be able to say, wait a minute, as I took a step back and realized a couple things, I realized one enemy had this strategy in play. Yeah. There was a, a demonic spirit that was really trying to rip this thing apart because he knew he was, he was intimidated by the, the work that could have come out of this. The, when, when, you know, kind of like uh, in Psalm where it says, <laughs> blessed are, are when brothers dwell in unity, right? We yeah. can say brothers and sisters, right? When, when you're under the, the unified work of God's kingdom, the Holy spirit, you've, you've laid down your own particular agenda and you're working after the kingdom of God man, there's this huge blessing and anointing on that. Well, the enemy knows that. So he's going to try to unravel it. He's going to get in and he always gets in to divide from the inside. So one, for you to be aware of that, but then two, to be aware of God was doing something in me, even though I felt like I was a a victim in this, or I had the, you know, this was, I had the upper hand, so to speak, in in, in what what was right. For you to step back and go, no, there was some, there was some cracks in my character that God was revealing in that. That's huge, Joanna. Like that's that, I think that can really bring us all a lot of insight into our own situations, especially relational tensions that we experience. Absolutely. I think so many times we miss the gift. We miss the gift because we are just so wounded. Right. And I use that. I use that as for me, at least that slippery slope of self pity. Like, how could this happen? I was so wronged. And, you know, the Lord was really gracious to just give me a glimpse of that, of my flesh Mm. and that it really wasn't all that lovely (laughs) and that there was some things he wanted to change. And, you know, I think the problem with playing the victim, and I use that loosely because there are definitely, there are definitely victims, but I think it can go for any situation. The problem with staying in that identity is that we miss the possibilities of what God might want to do with that pain. And, you know, Mm. we hear that don't waste the pain, right? Well, the best way not to waste the pain is to say, search me, oh God, see if there's any wicked way in me, any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. And, you know, I I just heard recently, you know, Psalms 23, uh, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. And then that second part, you prepare a table Mm. in the presence of my enemies that there is, there is the possibility of meeting God's presence hmm. in the valley of the shadow of death. That's right. Like we can meet it in no other way. There, right. There is a rich table, a buffet set before us. But that's if right. my eyes are so on the enemy, I hmm. miss the food that's in front of me that God wants to feed my soul. And so, you know, it really is. I, I just had to have the Lord's help and it didn't happen overnight, but I, I had to have his help to get my eyes off of them and what they wow. did and how they needed to change and even get my eyes off of my need to have everybody okay with me. I don't know wow. if anyone else has that, right? <laughs> no, like, nobody else struggles with that at all. <laughs> <laughs> like I can only be okay if you're okay with me, right? Wow. And to wow. like even be okay that I was being misunderstood. I was being misrepresented, Mm -hmm. okay with the fact that it it had kind of undermined my position as the pastor's wife in my ministry in the church. To be okay that, you know, geez, in Philippians 2, I love this portion where it says, have this mind that was in Christ Jesus who made himself of no reputation. Mm -hmm. Just that piece. 
Here's the deal. When we make ourselves of no reputation, we have nothing to defend and nothing to build. Wow. We leave it in the hands of God. Wow. And as the Lord just, and honestly, it was the crucible hmm. of this terrible misunderstanding, what felt like a betrayal and an injustice. And there are several others that, you know, in our life now, 41 years into full-time ministry, you wow. know, here's the reality, you know, People, we're, we're human beings. And so not only are we going to be hurt, but we're going to hurt other people, even though we don't yeah. mean to. Yeah. But if we can, rather than cause, letting that divide us and separate us, if we can bring that pain and say, Lord, what do you want to do? What is this revealing? Mm. What, what fault lines, what fig leaves that I've been looking to for significance to cover my nakedness that all of a sudden are being stripped away and I feel naked and vulnerable. And, um, what do you want to do? And I'll tell you, Oh my goodness, the Lord has met me at those points of pain. I remember being pregnant at 40 and I couldn't get okay with it, Davey. I'm a good girl who wants to do good things. I'm yep. a, I'm an approval addict. I'm a works-based a recovering Pharisee. Yeah. Uh, I'm yeah. all of that, right? And I have never performed more poorly. My first mm. reaction was, may it be to me as according to your word. Uh, you know, my life's mm. not my own. I've been bought with a price. But then my flesh woman just freaked out and I couldn't get okay. And yet in the, this time where I've never performed more poorly, I've never felt the love of God more completely, wow. you know, wow. just, just him saying, I understand, honey, I know this is not what you wanted. This isn't what you thought your life was going to be, Yeah. but I know what I'm doing. And this is a gift. And I can mm. tell you on the other side, Josh just, just graduated from high school and he is such a sweet gift to our soul. Mm. And yet even his life came wrapped in some things that we didn't expect. He was born mm. with low muscle tone. He's experienced some delays. We don't know what his adulthood is going to look like, but yeah. we know that he was purposed in the heart of God. Yeah. And so we just keep praying, Lord, give us the keys to his kingdom. Show us how to parent him. And even wow. realizing I'm parenting him for eternity. True. The full expression of who he's going to be may only be seen someday down the road, but this is a gift and Lord, don't let me squander it. Wow. Don't let me let the disappointment of what isn't swallow the joy of what is. It, it's just a beautiful thing, this journey with Jesus, but we've got to trust him. Yeah. True, man. I feel like I could ask, you know, a hundred questions based on some of the things that you were saying right there. It's just so rich, Joanna, so rich to, to be able to, to lean in to those places and see the parts of your soul that are fragmented, you know, and, and, and allow pain to, to reveal that to us, to illuminate that to us. And then to, and then to do the hard work of, tr of surrendering some of those places to the Lord. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, we have a lot of, I, I kind of want to go back a little bit to, to this, um, you know, to the, to the degree you feel comfortable, but I know there's a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of pastors, wives listening to this conversation and a lot of women in ministry, men in ministry. I mean, a lot of people in ministry context where they, they've experienced that twinge of uh, betrayal, hurt, relational strife. You know, it, it seems to, it seems to accompany ministry. Like it just, yeah. it, for whatever reason, there seems to be this, and, and I, I haven't been able to wrap my, my mind around it. I'm, I'm, you know, maybe one day when I'm 80 years old, looking back on everything, I could be able to say, Hey, let me kind of put some formula to this and help people have some construct to understand this. So I'm, I'm curious what your insight is into it, but what can you help illuminate to us? Maybe, maybe just so we can all feel a little bit more understood. What, why is it that it seems that when you are in a place of ministry, that there are expectations of you that don't seem realistic. Yeah. And, and, and so therefore there's this, a stage is set for you to fall short of those expectations and there to be relational strife or there, or, or, or why, why do we see so much betrayal? Why do, why do we see so much dis? It seems feels like disloyalty sometimes, right? As a, yeah. as a minister, like on our side of the perspective, a lot of times you feel like you give your whole life, your whole soul, you're sacrificing so much into ministry. And it seems like, it can be hurtful sometimes when it feels like people 
don't, um, there's not, uh, not even reciprocity. I don't know if that's what we're expecting, but it's like, you know, they just, the one little thing and they leave your church or one, you know what I mean? It's, there's, there's just so much of this relational. Why is it, why is that the climate it feels like in, in church? Well, I think, I think probably the big answer to that, the overarching answer is that God loves unity. And so Mm. of course the enemy is going to target that, right? Yeah. He's going to do whatever he can to so hurt. Um, you know, I think it's really important um, that we understand that it's not one sided. You know, mm. I, I've just realized that it, <laughs> you know, I, I had this lady come up and say, have I done anything to offend you? And I said, oh, no, not at all. Mm. She goes, well, you come up to a group of people and you, you greet everyone except me. And I realized, oh my goodness, you're right. I am so sorry. And I feel like the enemy knows, like he, he knows just like my fault line was need of approval. He knows the fault line of each person and he's going to do whatever he can to cause the wounding at the Mm. place that will be most effective. Right. And so as pastors, he, he wants to attack us as well. And, but I think it's important Mm. to understand it goes both ways because for sure that's what the enemy wants to do. He wants us to feel like it's just one sided that we're the one with the target on our backs. And I think Mm. we need to be a little careful of that. Even that terminology, if we're doing God's will, we're going to have a target on our back. Well, listen, Mm. we're God's people. So we're going to have a target on our back. All of us, because (laughs) all of us, that's right. Absolutely. Everyone, because same Satan hates God. And because Mm. God loves us so much, he's going to do whatever he can to take us out. Um, Big picture that has helped me with that understanding, you know, when someone says, you know, we're not just, we're just not being fed or, Mm. you know, we feel like we need a better program for our children or, you know, and all of the things that people say when they leave our church, the Lord showed me one time, he said, Joanne, if you really love those people, you're going to want them to be where they will thrive. Mm. And, and by the way, they're not your people. They're mine. And if I choose to move my sheep around because I've, they have a specific need that your church can't meet, then would you bless them? Would Mm. you, would you pray that God, that I will take them where they can flourish and grow? So I think that having that better perspective, that we're not taking everything so personal, that we know that this is, this is the flock of God. This is not my flock. This is not my church. And, and to also shed, the delusion that we're going to be everything people need. Yeah. Right? <laughs> right? Yeah. We've it's got good. to let go of that. And I think we do need to not take it. And this is hard, but not take it quite so personally. Um, mm. You know, here's the deal. The bait of Satan is offense. He mm. wants us to get offended and he's going to make sure that, wow. that we're going to be wounded. And here's the deal. If we don't deal with some of the offenses that have happened, some of the betrayals, and, and, you know, I talk about it a lot in the church, in the book. Yeah. I talk about, uh, you know, two different times. I don't go into all the details, but two different times we're in flourishing ministry. And yet it, you know, implodes the first time uh, a new pastor came, he decided he wanted a different staff. And though mm. he didn't do it correctly, he had full right to ask us to resign. And yet the wow. way it was done was so wounding, mm. so hurtful. This was a man that we loved and respected. He had been my childhood pastor. Oh, wow. And so to have it come down the way it did, ooh, the enemy wanted to take us out yeah, yeah. with the, in, the, the injustice of it all. I really believe that there's nothing harder to deal with than injustice. Injustice, that's right. Right? Wow. When wow. we can't figure out why it happened, when it feels so unfair, and boy, yeah. it is, it's, it's just this satanic setup to take us yeah. out. But again, wow. when we say, Lord, my life is yours, you get to do whatever you want Right. Paul, right. You know, in his ministry, he talks about all the things that happened to him. You know, it's quite a list. I have not been shipwrecked. I've not been beaten with rods. uh, You know, (laughs) I haven't been stoned and left for dead. But he ends that list by saying these words. Yet none of these things move me. 
for I did not count my life dear to me. And I do wonder if that's not part of the issue that I kind of count my life a little too dear. Wow. Wow. My, my reputation a little too precious and I get all moved. I get all shook up when Mm -hmm. things don't go my way rather than going, okay, Lord, I don't know what you're doing, but I trust you. And really, truly hammering out forgiveness. You know, I, I heard a statistic years ago and I couldn't track it down for the book, but they say that mismanaged hurt is the number one reason why ministers are leaving the ministry. Mm. And, and wow. I think it's probably accurate. And the enemy wow. is doing everything he can to sow offense in our heart, to build wedges that divide us. For us, uh, you know, not only had that happen, but um, we we went to this little church, 35 people, to, and God blessed it, and we grew to over 400. We built a new building, but as we're, in, I mean, it was so, it was, it was just so trite, like a building project, and then there's a church play, <laughs> right? You know, I couldn't believe it. It's like, really, yeah. this is happening? Yeah. And yet, that's exactly what happened, church, uh, where, again, this seed of discontent, very much like my experience with our women in ministry, mm. that there was some discord, sideways energy in the um, the leadership of our church. And, um, and so where our church had sent us to Hawaii on our 10-year anniversary, on mm. our 15th anniversary, they read a letter, the board read a letter asking for our resignation. Oh, you know? goodness. Now, they Man. didn't plan that. Right. But the enemy did. Yes. Maximum impact. Let's take him out with bitterness and offense. And again, we had to hammer out forgiveness and really believe God. Our lives are in your hands. Nothing thwarts your purposes. And I I remember this one day as I was, you know, it, 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 of course it was like a blow. Uh, where my crucible happened eight years earlier with our women's yeah. ministry. Now I watched my husband go through devastating pain. Yeah. And yet I knew what God had done in that incident of injustice, the things that he stripped from my soul that oh, I just pray I never get over. Right. Wow. Uh, Cause wow. here's the deal. He only reveals so he can heal. That's right. And so so when those fault lines are revealed, it's because God wants to do this incredible work in us. And so as we're there, I remember this one day I was like, I was walking through the house and all of a sudden this, and this doesn't even make sense, but it's so true. This overwhelming gratitude. Here we are. We've resigned our church. So they asked for our resignation, but we really felt the grace. Let me go yeah. back a little bit to walk through this because I, I firmly believe that you can go through church conflict and come out the other side whole. I mm. believe that. I was kind of excited that we get to be that church. But wow. instead, as we two weeks into the conflict, God individually told John and I that our time at this beautiful church was over. Wow. And that we were to, that he had someone else for that church and he had another church for us. And yeah. so we, we let go and surrender again. Yeah. This yeah. church that we dearly love six months into our new building, all our dreams, wow. all our hopes, all our, all our plans had to be let go because it's his church and not ours. That's right. right? That's and right. as I was walking through the church, the house one day, I was just so overwhelmed with this wave of gratitude to think that God would dismantle a thriving ministry to Mm. do something deep in us. Hmm. Now, that doesn't make sense, but here's the deal. I really believe that God's more concerned about building his kingdom in us than he is in building his kingdom through us, right? But the so enemy, good. the enemy wants to sidetrack us. He wants to take us out with the wound of events. Yeah. And if we cooperate with his plan, we're going to get frozen at that point of past pain. And wow. though we may be moving forward, we're really walking dead men and women because yeah. everything refers back to that tomb, to that place of betrayal. But if we give God access to that place, if we let him, by his grace, help us hammer out forgiveness and cultivate the unoffendable heart of Jesus, Mm. 
The wow. thing that the enemy meant for evil is going right. to boomerang back on his thieving That's and right. deceiving head. That's right. That's the power of our great redeemer, God. Oh, but we've got to cooperate. Oh, I love that. I mean, I love you know what you're saying here as far as cooperating with God, partnering with God, right? Yeah. That we do have, we do play a part in this. And I think sometimes when injustice happens, we can feel this sense of a complete loss of agency, right? Because there yeah. is something that we don't understand, so we can't control. We try to figure out how we can like change the situation or control something, control an outcome, and it, and we we're, we're at a loss. We can't, and so yeah. it can cause us to go. Well, that I'm completely out of control. The reality is, is we do have some control over certain things. We have control over how we respond. We have agency Absolutely. over how we partner with God in those spaces. And I love, I think you write about cultivating an unoffendable heart right? and how important that is and, you know, how, how necessary that element of trust is to do that. Because yeah. were it not for trusting that God is going to boomerang the situation, right? In mm -hmm. his time. Yeah. Looking forward to seeing that, then then there's no way we could, it feels like, humanly cultivate an unoffendable right. heart. Like, how do we just let injustice go if we're not trusting that God's going to be the ultimate judge of this, that he's going to be a yeah. much better judge than what we could be in our own nature? Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, here's why I think we struggle to forgive, because mm -hmm. we secretly think people have ruined our lives. Wow. Wow. Right. Really, Look at really. Joseph, right. Look at the story. Absolutely. Of Joseph. In fact, I really, I really dive into that in the chapter mm. called living beyond your dreams because mm. right. God's given us a dream. He's, he's called us That's to right. ministry. He's called us That's to right. do these big things. And all we have is obstacles. And yeah. when you look at the story of Joseph, he, he had every right to just sit down and self pity and give mm -hmm. way to bitterness and just rage. I, I'm a slave. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be the most entitled, bitter, angry, resentful slave possible. Yeah. No, instead yeah. it says this, this boy who, who some scholars say his coat of many colors was actually a symbol from his father that son, you're never going to have to work a day in your life. Mm. That boy is now a slave. Does he give way to self pity? Wow. He gets up. And he serves with all his might and with such excellence that he's yep. put in charge over all of Potiphar's house. And then when he's betrayed by, by Potiphar's wife and falsely mm -hmm. accused in prison, he rises up through the ranks because he refuses bitterness. And he yeah. simply, he simply works at everything he does as working into the Lord. And God mm -hmm. was with him and he prospers. And it's years and years goes by before the dream that he had an That's idea right. how it was going to turn out is actually fulfilled. That's the right. dream that he had was so small. And it was those incidents of injustice, the time in the pit, the time in the prison that prepared him for the palace. And yeah. I think we miss it. We miss the opportunity to become the people God wants us to be, not just for his purposes, but just right. the fullness, like, like that he uses the injustice, he uses the pain to actually strip away all the things that are, are obscuring what he had in mind when he made the original us, wow. right? Wow. Yep. Yep. So Man. there's a gift. There's a gift, but oh, it's so easy to miss. Believe me. It's, I, and I still, I still fall, fall for the plots of the enemy. I still get sucked yeah. down into self-pity, um, just resentment, shame, all the things that he uses against us to keep us from moving forward in God. But I really mm. believe that if we can trust God at the place where it's the most hard to trust, hmm. you know, and here's the deal. Trust isn't an emotion. It's a choice. That's it. And I keep waiting to trust. Well, I probably won't get around. I, I keep waiting to understand and then I'll trust. Well, I won't get around mm. to it. Instead, we'll keep eating from the wrong tree, trying to understand wow. why things happen. Having, well, that and labeling, that's good. That's bad. That's wrong. That ruined my life. We're yeah. eating from the wrong tree yeah. rather than accepting the tree of life that's made available through Jesus. I believe trust wow. is the key back to the garden back yeah. to intimate friendship with God and coming back under his umbrella of provision and protection, his ability to take mm. all that the enemy has meant for evil and turn it for good. Wow. 
Wow. That's so good. And I, I want to zero in on that for a couple minutes, you know, before we kind of close out the conversation, because that's what, that's the, but probably the primary thing that anybody who's going through some kind of trauma, tragedy, major life transition, some kind of pressure point in life, yeah. that's the thing that we wrestle with the most, mm-hmm. you know, and, 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 I, and for a lot of reasons, I think, I think some of us, uh, we, we grow up with a, a fault, a faulty understanding of who God is. And so we don't recognize him as a, a loving, good father who can be trusted. Yeah. Um, some for some of us, it's because we've experienced things that tell us that that's our worldview, and so uh, you know the, the the experiences we've had, the trauma we've endured, the tragedy that befell our lives, whatever it is, right? It's informed us, man. God must not be able to be trusted. Yeah. We kind of equate one plus one equals two there in that situation, and so I, I wonder if you if you can speak to to trust in terms of you know how do we how do we gain a sense of, of God and his right character. Yeah. So that we can trust him, right? Cause trust is a choice. And then that choice does, it, you know, it, it, it comes to from like seeing God rightly, but so many right. of us don't see God rightly. So how do we, how do we foster that or engender that almost right. so that trust can become natural, right? Like, mm. it, you know, if I'm a, if I'm a good earthly father, my kids just kind of naturally trust me, That's you know, it. they're, they're almost very um, gullible. If I tell them something, they're like, oh yeah, I believe it. Cause dad told me, <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> that's right. Right. It's so naive. And yet Jesus said, unless you enter the kingdom, like, yeah. one of these. I right? think that, I think that's a huge part, you know, cultivating childlike faith, not childish faith. Yeah, that's good. Right. Yeah. And that's kind of where it gets tricky because that childishness can kind of get in there and we begin, begin to demand and um, insist Mm-hmm. Rather than just believe daddy loves me. And if he said no to that, that's okay. You know, mm-hmm. uh, one of the gifts that Josh has been to us is he has like the purest heart of anyone I've ever known. And uh, he just, I was asking the Lord one day, I'm like, he's blowing my mind because he just obeys me. Like my mm-hmm. first two kids didn't, nest, they're great kids. But when I said, clean your room, they didn't just go clean their room, <laughs> right? Hmm. They'd fight me or or they'd put it off. Josh just obeys. And I was asking wow. the Lord that one day and he goes, well, it's because he trusts you. He hmm. believes that you have his best in mind. And yeah. so I think, I think that that cultivating that childlike faith that just isn't, uh, it's not wavered when things don't go our way. Right. Mm. That it's that Psalms 131 that I've calmed and stilled my soul like a weaned child at his mother's breast where we really believe, Lord, you're my source. And if I need it, you'll provide it. And if you don't, maybe I didn't need it, which is a little revolutionary. But for me, for me, that it's been a lifetime work. And I think being okay that it's a process. Yeah, but yeah. constantly staying engaged in that process. You know, mm. someone has said we only trust the ones we know. So cultivating that relationship wow. with the Lord, you know, not just settling for a former religion and going through the motions, not going to his word, just to check it off our list, but going with an expectation that he's going to speak to us through his Holy Spirit, that he's going to yeah. give us something uh, that our soul needs. But um, I, I really was asking the Lord, I, I didn't want this to be a Band-Aid book, you know, Mm. just trust the Lord, sister. You know, it's interesting how it's so trite. It can feel that way sometimes. It can, but it's so true. And yet, (laughs) yet how how can it become more? Well, I, I really asked the Lord, how can I build a platform for faith? And I felt like he just gave me kind of four pillars that we can build our lives on. Mm. And Four unshakable truths. Because here's the problem. When I'm not going through something hard, I find it easier to trust him. I see the big picture. But when I'm up against it and I can't see any way around it, over or under it, and that obstacle feels more real than the goodness of God, I've got to, I've got to have some truths that I back up and see the big picture. And so that first pillar is God is good. And to be Mm. honest, that, that seems like such a tame word. But it encapsulates yeah. all that God yeah. is, like his goodness, like really think about like 
good all the way through, not good yeah. some days and bad other days. You know, he doesn't have, God doesn't have good days and bad days. He's good. And wow. so his, all of his perfection, all of his wisdom, all of his power is encapsulated in that. And as I've been kind of even studying the attributes of God, I've got a, a I've got an appendix in the back that kind of has a, a list of some of the attributes that if we could just camp on one of those for a while, yeah. study yeah. it out and really see, because here's the problem. I think we convict God on circumstantial evidence, right? Mm. Right. Because my circumstances wow. are bad, then you must be bad. Wow. And we're blaming God for the very thing that our own rebellion brought forth. You and I were wow. only meant for good. I think that's why we, why we just instinctively think this is terrible. This ought not to be yeah. right. It was never intended to be broken and fallen and evil. We're the ones that introduced evil into the wow. world. And so wow. if I can come back to God is good all the time, even when I don't see it, when I don't feel it, he is good. Number two, he loves me. And I think mm. this is part of our problem. There's chronic love doubt among Christians. We yeah. know it in our head, but it hasn't made it to our heart. And so asking the Lord, reveal your love to me. Number three is I belong to him. Well, that's mm. out of the four things. This is the only one that I really have any agency over. Have right. I fully surrendered my life to God? And that's we have good. all sorts of yeah. yeah buts for that. Well, I'm a Christian, <laughs> but, you yeah. know, yeah, yeah, I've given control of God for that. But, you know, my kids, my kids, I just can't let go of my kids. Mm -hmm. You know, have we fully surrendered to the Lord? Because when we do that, he has obligated himself to take care of his own. Mm, and I can good. go those four pillars if I can just focus on that, Lord, if, if, if I have those four pillars going down to bedrock, then yeah. Satan can huff and puff, but he ain't going to be able to blow my faith down. Wow. But if it's building my house on shifting sand of circumstance, one day it's good, one day it's bad. I mean, I always struggle to trust him. Wow. Wow. Joanna, that is so good. I love those four pillars. I love just just being able to break down that construct of yes trust can feel very trite especially if we just put a bandaid over our situation yeah. well you got to just trust the lord you got to trust the lord mm -hmm. however the more that um the more that i've walked through dark night of the soul seasons the more that i've interacted with other people there is a rich deep well yeah. when someone's when someone's walked through that and they can come out of it saying hey trust god in this trust That's god in this it. it it carries so much more weight and so I'm so appreciative of the weight that your words carry in that, because I know that you've walked through some very difficult mm -hmm. things and you've encouraged us today with this conversation. I want to make sure everybody picks up a copy of Embracing Trust. We're going to put it in the show notes, a link for you to get that very easily. Um, Joanna, thanks so much for spending time with us today and sharing your heart, sharing some of your story and sharing this work with us. It's just been an honor to talk with you. Oh, I feel the same way. I feel the same way. You know, I can just... I can just tell your listeners, you, you don't have to have blind faith. Yes, there mm. will be opportunities where you're not going to be able to see, but you have a very fully substantiated platform on which to build your faith. And it, and it goes wow. back to the faithfulness of God. We don't have to hold on to our faith and our That's ability it. to work up faith. We just hold on to the faithfulness of God. So good. So good. Man, thank you for that reminder, Joanna. We needed, we all, we all needed that today. Thank I you. do too. <laughs> hey friend, if you liked this episode, be sure to like and subscribe so that you can stay in the loop every time Nothing Is Wasted releases a piece of content here on this YouTube channel.